It's astonishing to contemplate the lengths to which people will go for wealth, recognition, and career advancement. They'll stoop to unimaginable depths to reach their objectives. Regrettably, I've experienced this firsthand through my wife's betrayal. I could have accepted it if she had been honest with me, but instead, she chose the most degrading path, and there will be consequences. The dynamic between Brent and Audrey took a curious turn after they got married. Initially, Brent held a position as a CAD designer at a prestigious firm, while Audrey was on her way to establishing her own legal practice. However, in just six years, their financial positions had reversed. Brent now ran a thriving CAD business from home, specializing in various design projects and earning a stellar reputation. Meanwhile, Audrey had transitioned into a high-ranking role as chief contracts manager at S.H. Woods Corporation, utilizing her legal expertise to climb the corporate ladder. They resided in Brent's ancestral London home, which was more than a century old, featuring high ceilings and drafts. Since their marriage, Brent had modernized the house by installing double-glazed windows and converting the smallest bedroom into an ensuite bathroom. However, Audrey harbored a preference for a residence closer to the city center, though she never vocalized her discontent directly. Instead, she subtly hinted at her discomfort by layering on extra clothing due to the perceived chilliness or expressing surprise at the escalating fuel bills despite their financial capability. Despite Audrey's subtle nudges for relocation, Brent cherished their home in London, coincidentally named Brent as well. He often teased his parents, questioning if they named him after the neighborhood, to which they playfully responded that the area was named after him. The locale boasted numerous parks and lakes, providing ample space for Brent's exercise routine. Although he managed his mild diabetes with medication and showed no outward symptoms, his recent medical checkup had left him concerned. Your bone density has decreased by almost 20%. Oh God! Are we discussing hip replacement in my future? It's not that serious, just a vitamin D supplement. Like those seven C's capsules? Similar, but as a health service diabetic, you receive all your medication for free, not only your glucagon but also vitamin D3. I'll write you a prescription. Lucky me. Take one of these every morning, but only during winter. In the summer months, spend time in the sunshine. A couple of overcast days will suffice. I want you to walk for an hour every day or have two sessions of 30 minutes. Their perspectives on life differed. Audrey enjoyed clubs, parties, and the buzz of getting tipsy. Brent, on the other hand, preferred the occasional beer, preferably at home, savoring the flavor rather than seeking intoxication. While they often dined out and socialized, Brent was content with quiet evenings at home or strolls in the local parks. Their first disagreement arose gently over dinner. I want us to move, Brent began. To somewhere more modern, closer to my workplace and the nightlife. You know how much I love this house, he responded. But I'm open to discussing it. Is this urge to move stronger now than it was, say, a year ago? Yes. S.H. Woods have been negotiating with the Chinese for six months now. You mentioned that. It does sound intriguing. It is. Next week, two of their executives are visiting to inspect our facilities. Facilities, plural. Other companies are vying for their business. I'm not sure how many, but the Chinese are visiting all of us. Do you have an idea who our competitors are? Not officially, but it's fairly easy to figure out. This is a significant development for us. I've mentioned before how deliberate and cautious Asians tend to be, but they're finally making progress towards a decision. We're being considered. I'm thrilled for S.H. Woods and for you personally, considering the effort you've put into this. But how does it impact our plans to move? I assume you prefer staying in London rather than getting an apartment closer to the nightlife in Beijing? She chuckled, Brent didn't often crack jokes. If we secure this contract, it'll be our largest deal yet. Ultimately, it'll boil down to me and the CEO, Nigel. I'll handle the fine details, and he'll give the final approval. So, we're talking about bonuses, right? Exactly. We're talking about your wife walking away with more than a quarter of a million pounds tax-free. 
Brent perked up. Wow. And I'd like us to finally move on from here, sell the place, and relocate closer to the city. I'll add my bonus to whatever we get from selling this house, and we'll split the ownership of the new one. Of course, we'll also decide together where we buy, it has to be a place you like too, alright? Since you enjoy making deals, how about this, you secure your big bonus, and we'll move. If not, we'll go on a lavish vacation to make up for it, then we can reconsider moving next year. Sounds fantastic. Have I mentioned lately how much I adore you? Ahead of their visit to China, Audrey and Brent experienced a surge in their bedtime activities during the summer days. Audrey's desire seemed boundless. They used to make love on weekends, maybe once a week, however, suddenly the situation changed. They made love almost every weekday, preferring to relax on weekends. Brent wondered about the reason for this change but decided not to express any suspicions. Finally, it was a big day for S.H. Woods, and Audrey and Nigel presented their job offer. The process took all morning, and Audrey returned home by mid-afternoon. Tell me, how did it go? Brent asked. Let me take a shower, and then we'll have dinner somewhere, she replied. The restaurant was nearly deserted due to the early hour. While they waited, enjoying their wine, Audrey shared details about their Chinese guests. Dressed impeccably in Seville row suits, they were taller than expected, especially considering the regional height differences between people from Beijing and the northern regions compared to those from the south. You would have admired the woman they brought along. Tell me more. She was stunning, tall like them, adorned in a traditional Chinese dress of red and gold. We call it a Chan Sam, but they pronounce it as Chow. It's spelled Q-I-P-A-O. The one with the slit on the side? Yes, hers had slits on both sides. It featured a high neck, what we'd call a mandarin collar, covering her arms. Instead of buttons, it fastened down the front with small pegs, similar to a duffel coat but intricately embroidered. And it was incredibly form-fitting too. Interestingly, she mentioned that the slits aren't just for showing off her legs, they're functional for walking. Was she a companion? I doubt it. They presented her as their interpreter. The men clearly understood English but pretended not to. Perhaps she was simply there to divert attention for English businessmen, to break their focus. Could be. I'm pretty sure I'm the only woman they'll interact with on this trip. Maybe they see you as a distraction. Their stakes arrived. You find all this exciting, don't you? Brent said. I do, replied Audrey. Contracts may not be everyone's favorite, but I thrive on the intricate details. I mean, it's very mesmerizing. You've been quite active the past few weeks, especially on weekdays. Not that I'm complaining, mind you. She set down her knife and fork. You know, I never really considered it, but you're right. I suppose I have been. Don't pour any more wine. I'll need a refill as soon as we get home. And that's exactly what she got. Brent barely had time to close the front door behind him before they were engaged in intimacy. After that, the bed smelled of their encounter, and Audrey snored softly next to him. Feeling tired, he wondered what had woken him up. He replayed in his head what she had said in the restaurant, but what had he missed? Then, when he began to fall asleep again, he remembered her words, I'll need more. It was a remark about both intimacy and wine, but it didn't quite fit. You fill your fuel tank or wine glass when there's already some in it, when it's empty, you fill it up again. Did she want to make love to him while already doing it with someone else? Was that the real reason she wanted to take a shower as soon as they got home? Perhaps this thirst for thrills could, so to speak, spread to her workplace. She often worked overtime, especially with the CEO. If this attraction had possessed her while she was there, then Nigel would most likely have benefited. After the Chinese clients left, Audrey's mother fell ill suddenly. She was diagnosed with a brain tumor. When they visited her in the hospital, the doctor led them into an office. Your mother had been complaining of headaches for some time, the doctor inquired. Not really, Audrey replied. Mostly, she's had trouble sleeping. It seems she hasn't been very forthcoming. 
But does she have a medical background? The doctor probed. Yes, she was a pharmacist. She retired early, two years ago. Now I wonder if this contributed, Audrey pondered. Ah, then it's possible she was self-medicating, the doctor noted. Could that have worsened her condition? Audrey asked. Probably not. She likely didn't know what was wrong. Treating headaches or insomnia wouldn't have harmed her, the doctor explained. So, what's the diagnosis? Audrey inquired. I'm afraid the tumor is quite advanced and terminal. There's nothing more we can do, the doctor somberly relayed. We have financial resources, Audrey mentioned. Even the most expensive surgery wouldn't significantly improve her condition, the doctor responded. I understand. What do you suggest then? Audrey asked. She can go home tomorrow. She'll be more comfortable in familiar surroundings. Monitor her closely and bring her back if she experiences severe headaches, the doctor advised. Do you have an estimate of how long she has? Audrey inquired. We can't be certain, but I'd estimate up to six months. We're nearing the end. I'm sorry, the doctor expressed sympathetically. They both made every effort to convince Sue, Audrey's mother, to move in with them. There was ample space, and with Brent working from home, he could easily keep an eye on her. However, she remained firm in her desire to spend her remaining time in her own home. Brent understood her perspective and promised to visit her every day. During the first week, she requested a private conversation with him. I need your help with something, Brent. Of course, anything, Mom. I used to have trouble sleeping, so I took some tablets from work as a parting gift. Job perks, huh? Exactly. But these new headache pills are much more effective for me. I don't need the old ones anymore. And you want me to discreetly dispose of them? Yes. Why not just flush them down the toilet? They're in my bathroom cabinet, and honestly, I'm having trouble reaching up there now. I'll take care of it for you. Please don't tell Audrey, though. She always worried about me self-prescribing medication. No problem. What are they called? They're Rohypnol. I took three packets of 30 each when my insomnia started. They're the original white ones. Is that significant? So, when the police discovered that they were used on dates to make it easier to lure a person into bed, the manufacturers added a blue dye to the drink to make it easier to identify. We were supposed to dispose of all the old stock. That's another reason I want you to get rid of them. You mischievous old thing. I'll go find them, but I don't want Audrey to know. The last forty or so are in a large white aspirin bottle. Brent headed straight to the bathroom. There sat the large bottle of aspirin, but it was empty. He searched through her other medications, then scoured all around her kitchen cabinets but had no luck. Uncertain of what to do next, Brent considered that Sue did seem to be experiencing memory loss. She appeared fully rational and showed no other symptoms. Moreover, it seemed improbable that she could have consumed all forty pills. So where could her stash of Rohypnol be? Had she disposed of them already and forgotten? Deciding to keep quiet, Brent went home. Before returning home, Brent took a brisk walk around a nearby park. Upon arriving home, the phone rang. It was Audrey. Things are progressing rapidly now, she said. In what way? asked Brent. They raised a question about our contract. Is that a problem? No, it's actually good news. They're questioning our delivery times. I always anticipated this possibility, so I included some flexibility. If this is their only concern, we might be in the clear. We just need to make adjustments swiftly. That sounds promising. I believe it is, but I need a favor. Tell me. It's 10 a.m. now, which means it's 5 p.m. in Beijing. They've requested a Skype meeting within 24 hours. Nigel and I will be working straight through lunch, but we've been indulging in too much fast food. Could you please prepare a salad for two around five? Sure. Do you intend to dine here? No, if we attempt to finish this at one of our homes, 
we're likely to forget something important back at the office. I just plan to quickly go home, change clothes, grab a salad, and return to the office. Then we'll continue working until it's done. Consider it done. Would you like a bottle of wine as well? Absolutely not. No alcohol until this is sorted. Understood. Even over the phone, he could sense her excitement. He wondered if they might have time for a quickie while she changed. Perhaps he could assist her with undressing. At four o'clock, Brent prepared three ham salads and boiled half a dozen eggs. He stored two of the salads in Tupperware containers and placed them in a cooler bag along with three bottles of mineral water, adding two of them to the bag. Afterward, he placed the bag in the refrigerator. Then he brewed some strong coffee and poured it into a thermos flask. He drank the remaining coffee and took the last salad and bottle of water to his home office. Brent was working on designing an extension for a nearby warehouse, which the client seemed satisfied with so far. Their only concern was the impact on their parking area. Brent was currently attempting to maximize the number of vehicles that could fit into the remaining space. He found that diagonal parking slots provided a couple of extra spaces. Feeling thirsty from the salty ham, he finished his mineral water and continued his work. However, his mind kept wandering, so he made himself another cup of coffee. He was worried about someone named Nigel and hoped Audrey wouldn't rush to shower when she arrived. Yet, everything she did seemed reasonable. He had searched for signs of infidelity, like new lingerie or stains in her underwear, but found nothing suspicious. Perhaps he was just imagining things. Audrey burst into his office at half past five. Did you make any salads? I don't see any in the fridge, she asked. Brent headed to the kitchen. They're already packed in the cool bag on the third shelf. Great idea, she praised. She poured him an old speckled hen and brought it to his office. Here. Thanks. What's this for? For being an amazing husband. Tonight, I'm going to show you how much I appreciate you. This will give you strength if you stick to just one. She headed upstairs. I only have time for a coffee. Can you make one? I've already brewed a flask for two. That's really thoughtful. Have I told you how much? I love you, Brent said as he returned to his warehouse, feeling refreshed after a momentary break from his computer. He realized there was space for additional cars at the far end of the building where the lorries loaded. At most, an employee might need to wait briefly while a truck maneuvered. He didn't hear the shower running. Part of him wanted to catch Audrey before she hurried off again, although he knew she wouldn't return to work dressed in stockings and high heels. Still, he was curious about what something more comfortable meant. Audrey rushed into his study carrying an old shopping bag with their salads in a thermos and greeted him with a hug and a kiss. If I'm late, don't start without me, she said as he heard the front door slam and her car drive off. Brent breathed a sigh of relief. Audrey's hair was pulled back into an unattractive ponytail, and she wore loose jogging clothes and sneakers. She looked less appealing than when she'd arrived, and she hadn't showered. No reason to worry after all. He took small sips from his pint, letting out a belch and realizing he wouldn't be able to finish it. Had he known Audrey would be so attentive, he wouldn't have indulged in extra coffee and a bottle of water. Returning to the kitchen, he forced down one more mouthful before pouring the remainder down the sink. A pity, but it would go flat soon anyway. He didn't want Audrey to think he didn't appreciate her gesture, so he washed and dried the glass before putting it away. Even that small amount was starting to make him feel groggy. He woke up feeling disoriented. The bedroom window seemed out of place. It was directly in front of him, it should have been on the right. Not one to panic, he stared at it and tried to figure out the problem. Ah, got it, he wasn't in bed, he was on the old sofa in his office. It wasn't the first time he'd fallen asleep there. He felt dizzy. Taking a deep breath, he thought to himself that if a few sips of beer could make him feel this way, he must be getting old. It was dark both in his office and outside the house, and he wondered what time it was. It must have been after 8 o'clock, it stayed light until then. It felt like too much effort to check his watch. 
he turned his head to look at the faint streak of light that stretched across the floor. It was seeping out from under the door, indicating that there was a light on outside. Audrey must have been at home. As he watched, the light gradually expanded. Her silhouette emerged from the doorway. The outline of her head was unmistakable and her hair was no longer tied back. Before he could see her anymore, he closed his eyes and pretended to be asleep. She opened the door completely, whispering softly, Brent. He wasn't sure why he kept silent, perhaps because of the blanket she had covered him with or because of the feeling that she was sneaking around. However, keeping his eyes closed seemed like a wise decision. Gradually, the streak of light disappeared as she quietly closed the door. As he lay in the dark, everything became clear. He must have dozed off during the break. Audrey returned home and sheltered him. He wondered vaguely if she still wanted intimacy. He opened his eyes and realized that he wanted to ask if she had finished renegotiating the contract. So, he sat down and looked at his watch. 11.15, almost midnight. The realization made him wake up. He got to his feet. As he turned the door handle, a soft sound caught his attention. Audrey stood in the hallway, picking up the wall phone. He hoped it wasn't more work related to the contract. He cracked the door open and, upon hearing her hushed conversation, froze. Was the drive home uncomfortable with those noisy empty balls? Nigel had visited. Brent, now clear-headed, listened to Audrey's side of the talk. No, he's still fast asleep. I gave him two. He probably won't wake until morning. Don't worry, I've already changed the bed sheets. He won't suspect a thing. So tonight, you're going to make love to me in our bed. So, what's next on your list? You're so dirty, Nigel. I had a feeling that this might be the case. No, it's okay. I have everything I need. There was a long pause. You're crazy. What if Brent is right next to us on the bed? We may need three pills to do this. No, he will never find them, at least not yet. I hid them where he wouldn't even think to look. Well, maybe we can work for four or five people together, but only if we sign a contract. Okay, I have to go. See you in the morning. Brent quietly closed the door and returned to the couch. He was right from the beginning. He was angry, mostly at himself, and he wasn't going to forgive Audrey or Nigel for that matter. Audrey went to the door, and he pretended to be asleep. She opened it slightly, whispered his name, and then left, clearly heading upstairs to the marital bed now with freshly laundered sheets. Brent lay in the dark, preoccupied with thoughts of revenge. It was clear to him now that she must have discovered the medicine in her mother's possession and wanted to give it to him. The betrayal caused him deep pain. They enjoyed his salads and drank his coffee, waiting for him to give up. Then they desecrated his bed in his own house. If he hadn't drunk so much beer, he might never have known. He vowed to cause them both great pain. He thought he would not fall asleep again, but after five minutes, he succeeded. He woke up around six o'clock the next morning, surprisingly unharmed. He heard Audrey get up at seven o'clock, and shortly after that, she came into the office with a cup of coffee. Brent groaned and tried to sit up, holding his aching head. You were sleeping soundly last night so. I covered you up and let you rest. Thank you, and sorry about that. I must have overworked myself. I've been dreaming about warehouse parking lots all night. Actually, in the dreams, I remember there were broken contracts and dirty sheets. I hope you didn't come home too late. Don't worry. I think you should have found someone else to have fun with. What? I was just joking. Oh, it turns out that I was just as exhausted as you were in the end. Good. What time did you arrive? About eight o'clock. Brent couldn't help but wonder if she really had a three-hour intimacy session while he was sleeping. I have to go. There's an important day ahead. Good luck. Let me know how it went. He sat down at his desk, mulling over the conversation he had just had on the phone. She had asserted that she had hidden the pills in a location he would never think to search. So where might that be, or rather, 
Where might they not be? He ventured into the bedroom, then hesitated. It had to be a place he wouldn't think to look. But unbeknownst to her, he had overheard her words. It had to be somewhere easily accessible to her, yet inconspicuous to him, perhaps hiding in plain sight, not in purses or pockets, some were visible to him yet camouflaged. Then he recalled her mention of for the time being. It implied a temporary hiding spot. Her mother's suggestion of a large aspirin bottle came to mind. Brent entered the ensuite bathroom. The medicine cabinet seemed like the logical place to stash pills where they wouldn't draw any suspicion. He opened it, glanced inside, and instantly knew their whereabouts. His oversized vitamin D bottle, stark white, caught his eye. He wouldn't need to use it until summer's end. Yet he inspected it now and found his suspicion confirmed. He carried it downstairs and emptied its contents onto the table. His supply of vitamin D was seized, presumably for later use. However, she went further than just replacing the pills. There was a small sediment at the bottom of the bottle. She had carefully crossed out the name of the pill from each pill. Audrey was quite cunning, but he was no less astute. Returning to his desk, where he was most productively thinking, he considered the situation. It turned out that the insidious woman was moving up Nigel's wish list, and the next item apparently included experimental intimacy, presumably with him incapacitated next to them. This man was unusual, and Audrey was even more unusual. He had a significant amount of pills, and she probably wouldn't have noticed if he'd taken a few. He drank six and put the rest in a jar, then put it in the bathroom cabinet. She called at 10.30. We've secured the job. The Chinese delegation is arriving to finalize the contract. We'll pick them up at Heathrow at 11.45 tomorrow morning. That's fantastic news. Great job, both of you. We'll take care of the final details today, then. Nigel wants to treat us to dinner tonight. Both of us? Absolutely. He wants to thank you for the salads and coffee. He's made a reservation at Clough. What about his wife? She's visiting her sister until tomorrow afternoon. He's planning a company-wide party this weekend, and she'll join then. We can all celebrate again. Sounds good. Nigel mentioned he'd like to visit our place before dinner. He's curious about where I live and wants to try your old speckled hen. I suggested we have a beer together before dinner. He'll be here before six. Agreed. Bren had to act fast. Previously, he had constructed a garage extension complete with a utility room and a greenhouse for his neighbor Ted, who happened to be the head of security at Heathrow Airport. Brent swiftly booked a flight for the next morning using Audrey's credit card, citing the need for special arrangements. He arranged to drive in and discuss further upon arrival. Subsequently, Brent contacted Ted. The staff at the information desk were cooperative and understanding. Ted arrived and managed to convince them that Brent's requests were not uncommon. He assured them he would take care of everything. Brent slipped him 25 pounds and confirmed he would be on duty the following day. When Brent returned around 5.30, Audrey arrived in her Citron, pulling into the garage while Nigel's Mercedes parked in the driveway. Brent poured three beers, spiking two of them with a roofie. They entered the room, buzzing with excitement, and exchanged introductions. Just poured these, Brent said, placing their glasses on the counter. Do you store it in the fridge? Nigel inquired. Technically, it should be at room temperature, but in the summer, I keep it in the fridge. The landline rang, prompting Brent to step into the hallway. No one was on the line. He couldn't help but admire her cunning. She must have speed dialed from her mobile, likely kept in her pocket. It was evident what had happened to his drink. Must have been a wrong number, Brent announced upon returning. Before he could settle, Nigel raised his glass. Cheers. They clinked and sipped. This is fantastic, Nigel praised. Brent took a small sip, pretending to have a mouthful before swallowing. Excuse me for a moment. Need some fresh air. Been stuck in front of the computer all day. Stayed indoors yesterday, and a pint of this hit me hard. 
he stood up, took another sip of beer, and exited through the French doors, taking his glass with him. Outside on the patio, he stepped out of sight and spat the beer onto the roses, hoping it wouldn't harm them. When the remainder of the pint was poured over them, Brent felt regretful about wasting yet another glass of his favorite drink. He retrieved his untouched beer stash hidden under a bush, poured a bit away, and returned indoors. Before sitting down, he raised his glass and proposed a toast. Here's to Nigel and my brilliant wife. They all stood up, clinked glasses, and took hearty sips. Then they chatted and steadily drank their beers. Soon, Nigel stood up again and exclaimed, Gam. What does that mean? Brent asked. It's Chinese for bottoms up, we have to finish our drinks, Nigel replied. They all emptied their glasses, and Brent suggested, anyone up for another? No thanks, we need to leave soon, came the response. Then come to our lounge. Five minutes later, they were heading out. After they were unconscious, Brent carried Nigel to the guest room where he bound his feet and hands with duct tape, making it easier to transport him later. He also taped his mouth shut, although he doubted it would be necessary for some time. He prepared Audrey's carry-on bag with carefully chosen items for her flight the next day, organizing her handbag as well. Afterwards, he assisted her into bed, ensuring she was comfortable. Tonight, she would indulge in the intimate act she cherished, but not with Nigel. He decided to seize the opportunity before her departure. Then he attended to the final details. Checking Nigel's pockets, he found his wallet containing his home address and the arrival details from Beijing. The names of the Chinese gentlemen, Mr. Chen and Mr. Wen, were noted on a large card by Brent. Nigel's phone contacts included Harriet H. and Harriet M., presumably his wife's home and mobile numbers. Brent sent her a message, won't be back until tomorrow afternoon. Get ready for a big surprise. He switched it off and headed to the kitchen, where he meticulously cleaned the beer glasses, ensuring not to overlook the one from the garden. Afterwards, he discreetly spiked two bottles of mineral water with a sedative each, setting his alarm for four in the morning. He then confirmed his appointment with the removal company over the phone. Heading upstairs, he engaged in a final intimate encounter with his soon-to-be ex-wife. Despite a strenuous session, he surprisingly slept well and checked on them both at four o'clock the next morning. Brent parked Nigel's Mercedes at Heathrow, giving him a final sip of water before leaving him asleep in the car trunk. He then woke Audrey up, dressed sharply in a suit for the occasion. Come on, you're going to be late for signing that important contract. What? What time is it? Here, have some of this to wake up. He called Ted, who met him at the information desk. The two girls on duty remained the same, and Brent presented Audrey's passport and ticket to them, confirming the story from yesterday. She was deeply afraid of flying despite attending the airline's first-timer course. This was her inaugural flight, though she had been given a mild sedative. Her fear persisted. I've arranged to accompany her airside. She insists on me escorting her to her seat. She only has this small bag as she checked in early, Brent explained. Ted offered to accompany Brent, and the lady summoned a member of the flight crew who was briefed on Audrey's situation and agreed to assist. While the cleaners were still at work on the plane, Audrey's seat was prepared. Brent had reserved seat 40K at the rear by the window, ensuring minimal disturbance. He stowed her bag beneath the seat in front, fastened her seat belt, and encouraged her to finish her water. Try to get some rest. Nigel will handle everything, he reassured her. Brent discreetly handed Ted the previously agreed upon 25 pounds, then returned to the information desk, assuring the staff that his wife was safely settled in her seat. He lingered at the airport for more than two hours before her flight took off, fueled by Starbucks coffee. He eventually made his way to the arrivals area. The flight from Beijing arrived punctually, and 15 minutes later, they emerged, traveling light with only small carry-on bags. They were among the first to pass through customs. Holding up his card, he greeted them. The interpreter, a stunning figure, inquired about Mr. Priest's whereabouts, though her pronunciation made it sound like Poli. Audrey mentioned their proficiency in English, albeit with a slight mispronunciation. 
welcome to London, esteemed guests. I'm Mr. Priest's chauffeur, and we will transport you to the location where the contract is to be signed. He assisted with their luggage. Once they were settled in the back of the Mercedes, he opened the trunk and stowed their bags where Nigel was dozing. Taking the driver's seat, he elaborated, Mr. Priest was revising your contract throughout the night. He's resting while I take the wheel. The interpreter conveyed his message as they headed to Nigel's residence. He anticipated Harriet's return by now. We won't be signing at your company. Apologies for the delay. We just need to pick up a witness for your signatures. As the interpreter translated, Brent sent a message from Nigel's phone to Harriet. I've been seeing Audrey for weeks, but rest assured, I'm home now. He abandoned them on the driveway and strolled away. They stretched their necks to watch him. Glancing back, he caught sight of Harriet dashing out, tossing Nigel's phone into a hedge, then hailed a taxi. He spent the afternoon supervising the packers as they loaded Audrey's belongings onto their truck. Soon, they were en route to the storage facility. Anticipating Audrey's uncertain timeline for retrieval, he found prepaying for three months reasonable. That evening, as Brent unwound with an old speckled hen, he reflected on her location. She would be landing in Beijing around this time. Of course, she had no checked baggage, just the light summer dress he had picked out for her. Due to Beijing's heat, he had thoughtfully left out her bra and panties. He wondered if she would be searched. He had taken away her spiked water bottle, and her purse contained only a plastic bag with two dozen rubies. He contemplated their legality in China. She had no phone, money, credit cards, passport, or return ticket. All she had was her carry-on bag, which held nothing unusual except for a bottle of old speckled hen, condoms, and a bottle of lubricant. How would this be viewed in Beijing? That's the end of the story. Share your thoughts in the comments, we'd love to hear them. And don't forget to like and subscribe to our channel to stay updated on new, equally intriguing and exciting stories. Good luck!